Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achiono and welcome back to my C++ series. So today we're going to be talking about control flow statements and really this is going to be a continuation of last week's episode. So if you haven't seen that episode about loops, definitely check that out. There'll be a link in the description below. Control flow statements work with loops. So in other words, they kind of give us a little bit more control as to how these loops actually run. We've kind of got three main control flow statements that we can use continue, break, and return, and they do different things. Continue can only be used inside a loop, and basically continue says, go to the next iteration of this loop if there is one, otherwise it'll just end the loop. Break is primarily used in loops, however it also appears in switch statements, and basically break just says, get out of the loop, so end the loop. And finally, return is probably the most powerful one if you want to consider it that way because return will just get out of your function entirely. So if you're in a function and you hit a return keyword, you will exit the function. Of course, for functions which actually need to return a value, when you type in return, you can't just have return by itself. Return by itself is only for void functions. If your function needs to return a value, when you type in return, you need to supply it with a value. All right, not much else to say really. Let's just jump in and take a look at some examples. So this is a program that we had in the last episode. If we just give that a run, you'll see we have hello world printing a bunch of times. And then of course we had a bit of a while loop which is nothing in a do while loop that does nothing. I'll just get rid of some of these because we don't really need them. The only one that I'll keep from our previous program is pretty much that for loop. So the first control flow statement that we'll look at is continue. Continue will skip to the next iteration of the for loop. So if I write continue over here, just like this, it will actually not impact the behavior of the for loop at all because that is already the end of the for loop. When it hits that line, it's going to continue to the next iteration anyway. So this doesn't modify the behavior at all. However, if I do something like if I mod two equals zero, and then have a continue there and run my program, you'll see that basically what's happening is it's skipping every second iteration, starting with the first one. So a better way to illustrate this is probably to include some kind of value. So instead of just logging hello world, we can also log the actual i variable to see what index it's currently at. And if I write that and I hit F5, you can see that our hello world statement only runs at odd iterations. In other words, when i is zero, it's not going to run because of course zero mod zero is zero. So it's going to continue because this if statement is true. Otherwise, when i is one, we're going to get log. When i is two, we're not. And when i is three, we are. And then when i is four, we're not. And then of course, i never hits five because when it hits five, we do not do the for loop because this statement says that i must be less than five. We can also change this to something a bit more simple, such as if i is greater than two, continue. So basically what should happen here is when i is zero and i is one and i is two, it should print out our log as well as what i is. However, when i is three or four, it shouldn't. So if we run that, you'll see we get hello world printing three times. Great. So that's pretty much it for continue. I mean, all it's going to do is when continue gets hit, it will skip to the next iteration, the for loop. If we actually debug this by putting a breakpoint here, this will give you some more insight. So you can see here i is zero, which of course is not going to trigger this. So it's going to go down to log and log and everything will be fine. Same for when i is one and i is two. However, as soon as i hits three and three is greater than two, we're going to go to continue, which means that if I hit F10 right now, instead of moving down to log, you can see it actually jumps back up to the start of the for loop and it will, it will do I++ and it will evaluate our condition and then jump back here. And of course, in this case, it's going to be the exact same behavior. All right, fantastic. That's continue sorted. Let's take a look at break. So if I just replace this code with break, it's going to appear to act the same way. You can see that we get zero, one, two, and we don't get anything else. However, if I go back to my first example of if I'm on two equals zero and hit F5, you can see we actually get absolutely nothing printing. Now, perhaps a little bit of a better example here is to actually print the first value. So I'll just do I plus one mod two equals zero. If we quickly replace this with continue, just so you can see what's happening here, you can see that instead of going odd numbers now, it's going even numbers. So we get zero, two and four printing. So if I replace this now with break, what's actually going to happen is it's just going to print that first one. Because as soon as it hits that break statement, that's it, that loop is over. Game over for that loop. If we place a breakpoint over here and we hit F5, you'll see the first time, of course, the if statement's not gonna be true, so we don't break. But then the second time we run through this for loop, and this is true, when we hit break, guess what? If I hit F10 right now, we jump straight out of the for loop into the next line of code. So that's it, break, breaks, our for loop completely. And of course, these kind of control flow statements inside loops apply to all loops. So for loops, while loops, do while loops, they work the same in all loops. All right, and then the final one we have is return. Now, 
this is a function that has to return an integer. So we can't just type in return. We have to return something. If we try and do something like this and we hit control F7, it's going to fail because you can see it's telling us that main function must return a value because the declaration states it has to return an integer. So I could do something like return zero. Zero, of course, is a valid integer. And if I run this code, it's actually going to immediately appear to close our program because, of course, we never get to the stdcn.get statement, which is the statement that keeps our window open because it's expecting us to provide input. So if I, again, put a breakpoint here and run my program, you'll see the first time it's fine, it'll log hello world, and we do actually get that hello world logging up here. Then the second time when I hit return zero, that's it. Look at that, it jumps right to that end curly bracket because this function is over. Now, one other thing to note with the return statement is that you don't have to use return inside a loop the same way that you have to with continue and break. Return can be written anywhere. So I could do something like if five is greater than eight, return zero. And of course I have to provide a value in this case because this function returns an integer. So return, not necessarily inside a loop, can be absolutely anywhere in your code. You also don't even have to have an if statement. You could have something like this. But of course, in this case, there is no circumstance under which this line would get triggered. So this is actually known as dead code. And some compilers, especially in other languages, will actually restrict you from writing code like this. Because I mean, at this point, you might as well just delete this line. It's never gonna get called. So that's pretty much it as far as control flow statements go. Return can be used anywhere and it will basically just exit the function. Remember, of course, if your function has to return a value, then return has to give it a value to return. These control flow statements basically form the basis of how, how your flow goes. So paired with loops and if statements and like all of these control flow statements, that is essentially the logic of programming. Those are the tools you have access to to control the flow of your program. Basically, which line gets executed next, right? Those tools. If statements and conditionals like that, loops and control flow statements. That is it. That is the only thing that can modify the behavior of your program, short from you actually writing into the instruction pointer. Don't do that, maybe. As this series progresses and we start actually writing applications, I'll be referencing all of these control flow statements all the time and showing you examples of where they're used and how I can use them, as well as probably showing you examples about how I can write the same code but without using them or with using a different statement. So if you want some more concrete examples of how they actually work, just stay tuned to this series and in future episodes when we actually start writing stuff, we're definitely gonna cover this because again, this is one of the fundamental building blocks of writing an application. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit that like button. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, link in the description below. If you really enjoyed this video and you wanna show your support and make sure that more of these awesome videos get made, you can support me on patreon.com forward slash the churner. Again, link will be in the description below. Next time, whew, I've got quite the episode for you guys next time. Goodbye.